Welcome, everyone, to the uh, November 28th uh, City Council Work Session. Today we are going to talk about two topics, on-site management for multi-unit rental housing and then the Sustainability Commission work plan. So first up is the on-site management for multi-unit rental housing. And as I recall, we had when we were talking about uh, student housing, we talked about um, the need for some oversight in those places. So anyway. Exactly. Thanks. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Nan Lawrence. Thank you. So we're here today to report back on the concept of multi-unit property management. Before we get into the details, I'd like to frame the issue. Concern over adjacencies and impacts on properties has come up many times. So the Envision Eugene discussion included issues such as neighborhood compatibility, adjacency, mix of uses, density, and housing choices. And we recognize that Envision Eugene uh, calls for a greater percentage of multifamily housing in the future, so we may be seeing more multi-unit proposals come our way. As you know, the social host ordinance discussion is also underway. But uh, the topic is really part of a larger ongoing conversation about mitigating the impact of multi-unit development. But the capstone discussion really highlighted the issue and related concerns. As part of the approval for the multi-unit property tax exemption for capstone, capstone was required to include on-site management functions, including maintaining management office staffed on-site, having at least one employee residing on-site, courtesy managers making nightly property inspections, and informing residents about good neighbor practices. As a result of this discussion, the direction to staff was to return with a mechanism for on-site management by the end of the year. So in response to that directive, we started out focusing on the language that was adopted for capstone, but we realized pretty quickly that a one-size approach uh, may not be adequate and doesn't really address the diversity of issues and possibilities that we found. So we're digging a little deeper to try to see what the problem is and what our response should be. We looked first at what was happening locally and then at other projects in other communities. In Eugene, as elsewhere, multi-unit properties encompass a wide range of housing choices. And our neighborhood analysis indicates that these are scattered all over our community. Most of the discussion has been on student housing, but in fact, multi-unit properties include rental property, ownership properties such as condos, student housing, senior housing, affordable housing, mixed ages and income surprisingly common throughout Eugene, and a wide range of sizes. Per our code, we consider multi-unit anything over three units. So I'm going to run through a few examples. This is Broadway Place downtown, 170 units. It's professionally managed. The management company is headquartered in Seattle, but they do have an after-hours manager who lives on site. High Street Terrace, 60 units. It is also professionally managed and includes a full-time on-site manager who works on site but doesn't live on the premises. Both High Street Terrace and Broadway Place, as with the other uh, multi-unit properties in Eugene, often have students living there in addition to other residents. Single-family converted houses. This is as an example. This one is in West University, and it has four units. And according to Eugene Police, both large and small properties can be problematic, including the converted single-family dwellings with large basements or backyard or porches, places where people can gather. So if you could imagine when there are more than five residents, they have a huge backyard or a basement. They're, they have space to invite many people over, and those are the situations where uh, the party can spill out into the street. Here's the recently completed Pearl at 17th and Pearl. It has 100 units. They do have a live-in manager through a local management company, which often uses a live-in manager for larger properties. But this company, for smaller <coughs> projects, they may have somebody living in one who manages others but doesn't live in there as well. The Tate is a condominium project, 45 units. Uh, the Tate allows uh, leasing, subleasing of units. So you could, for example, have um, a diversity of individuals living there as well. It's managed by a private company who's on the property multiple times a week taking care of the property, not managing behavior, and not living there. Willamette Towers, 94 units. It's an example of a high-rise mixed-use uh, building very close to our core. It houses a, a, really a mix of tenants. It's a condominium project, but similar to the Tate, many individuals sublease. So the demographics of this project, of the structure, are young and old and include students. 
So this building is governed by its own association rules and bylaws, and it has an on-site manager's office who works part-time during the week. They have their own rules and restrictions, and they have penalties for violations of rules and covenants, and um, they also have um, uh, regulations including quiet hours and enforcement of courteous behavior. Turpenine Terrace, also 94 units. This is a senior living project. An out-of-town management company oversees this, but maintenance people and a general manager work on site. So they have somebody available 24-7, but not living on site. In fact, they said that they did not want somebody living on site because if there's a problem, it takes too long to wake them up. And they prefer to have somebody alert, awake, on call there, working in those evening hours. In Eugene, what we saw was on-site live-in management, and also on-site but not live-in management, and then a, a sort of a, um, a variety of behavior restrictions and fines and ways to encourage um, appropriate courteous behavior. So we took a look at what other communities are doing. Um, the AIS says 10. I think we're up to 15 or more now because we keep digging deeper into um, examples that we're finding. So we looked to see what these other communities are doing then there are as many scenarios as there are communities. We focused on student housing examples, but the regulations are for multi-unit properties. So I'll run through these quickly and then give you a summary of the lessons that we've learned. Aurora, Colorado, uh, they have a crime-free multi-housing program and a nuisance abatement ordinance. They also require a local agent. If an owner lives out of town, someone um, who is hired on behalf of the owner who lives locally and can respond very quickly in emergency has to be registered for this for each of these projects. You'll see that a number of communities have that local agent requirement. So the owner or the local agent is also required to attend training which explains the rental ordinance and gives essentially a crime prevention through environmental design overview. It goes over agreements, fair housing laws, um, gang and drug awareness. Um, this is for large and small uh, properties. What we found is that the, um, this requirement addresses the small property owners subdividing or leasing houses by providing them essentially professional management education. So some of the smaller properties may not have a professional manager, but they are learning how to manage their property by going through this training. Iowa City has a code compliance settlement agreement. Um, they also distribute a good neighbor guide, similar to what the U of O does, which defines nuisances and appropriate behaviors. This community originally considered an on-site management and safety plan requirement, but instead they created a settlement process instead. So instead of requiring it, they go after offenders. And the sanctions can be imposed on the landlord, like restrictions to the rental permit. It can also result in tenant eviction. Over Colorado has a rental license agreement and resolution. Uh, they also require a local agent. They have a coordinated approach of enforcement education and zoning regulations. They're trying to get at different types of alcohol serving establishments through their zoning and land use laws. That's what they've seen as problematic for their community. Bloomington, Indiana. They have a quiet nights program focused on enforcement. The program finds properties that exceed the noise standards, and those funds are used to run the program. Corvallis has a definition of a chronic nuisance property. Uh, problem properties are referred to a hearings official for resolution and action. And if unresolved, the property can be shut down. The closure can target one or more units or the entire building. Duluth, Minnesota has a less intrusive approach. They essentially provide an incentive for compliant properties. The university maintains a list of properties available for lease, and if a property is problematic, it's not on the lease. It's not on that list. Um, and if you're off the list, you're not permitted to get back on the list uh, for a certain period of time, and only if the problems have been taken care of. So it's an incentive approach, essentially. Fort Collins, Colorado, is a community with a lot of similarities to Eugene. And that community is working on the Student Housing Action Plan. It's a collaborative effort between the city of Fort Collins and Colorado State University. The genesis of that plan was the need to identify strategies to address the increasing need for student housing, 
identify key preference for preferences for development and it develops strategies to resolve compatibility issues. It's similar in many ways to our neighborhood livability working group. They also have strict occupancy limits, one related family plus one individual. And that number can be exceeded, but only where permitted and it's subject to application and review. In contrast, we allow five unrelated individuals in a unit. St. Paul, Minnesota, um, they're dealing with the same issues as these other communities. And specifically, they're trying to address the homes that are converted from single family to student housing, so that the smaller multi-unit properties. Their focus is on regulating behavior, and they're trying to do that through outreach, lease terms, um, and enforcement. Um, so it's a, it's a different tack than, uh, for example, Corvallis, which says, this, these are the rules, if you don't follow these rules, then here are the consequences. So St. Paul is really opening it up for a, kind of a bigger discussion, but really trying to get at the promotion of courteous behavior. St. Cloud, Minnesota, they did a student housing zoning study, and they actually now have a social host ordinance similar to the one that's under discussion here. They also have a rental license agreement. So if you lease properties, you have to have a license to do so. And then there are regulations and an education process that goes with that. Their rental property owners and managers are required to attend a yearly landlord training. They have to apply for a city permit. To obtain the permit, they have to follow certain conditions, conditions, maintain their properties to a certain standard, and failure to do so can result in the loss of that permit, and essentially the loss of the ability to rent their properties. So here's what we've learned. First of all, Many communities are struggling around these same issues. There's a variety of approaches in different communities, mostly focused on town-gown issues. There are new ideas that we saw that we hadn't considered here, such as the local agent requirement or the requirement for proactive training through the police. Our police is actually doing something similar, but not as extensive. The management is critical, not necessarily live-in management. Response to complaints is another critical area. What we're seeing is that often the person who complains is a tenant in the building, and sometimes there's retaliation for complaining. And sometimes the on-site manager, if it's a living manager, for example, is reluctant to call because they live there. No one-size-fits-all, especially given the problems with smaller communities. Smaller pro properties, in fact, may be more of a problem in terms of enforcement. The larger properties have other issues in terms of neighborhood impact. So there's no perfect template. We're continuing to learn from these communities, and we already have several components that our community is doing already. So our approach will need to include a variety of strategies to get at the issues of adjacencies and compatibility and positive outcomes. So we're interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, we have a number of questions such as, should the regulations apply to new development or existing properties? Town, gown, adjacencies, and attitudes? Is this a geographically defined problem? <coughs> what size of property are we looking at? We've seen problems in strategies for fewer and for more units. Are there particular strategies that resonate, um, like the local agent or the rental license? And are there unintended consequences, like housing cost issues or something that works for students but doesn't necessarily work as well for seniors? And partners and stakeholders, are we coordinating with the right folks? So we'll continue to take to do our research and refine our efforts, just as other communities are doing. And we'll also work with our partners in neighborhoods and with Eugene Police. So based on today's discussion and further direction, we'll bring this issue back to Council as part of a coordinated strategy. I'm available for questions if you need. Thank you. Thank you. Very thorough. Okay, so you have your list of questions in front of you that um, they're wanting input for. Anybody ready to go to make any comments, questions? George. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, really interesting. Thanks for doing that, all that research from other communities. Um, you know, I'd just like to remind everyone that, that the um, – if my memory serves me correctly, this became a question during the capstone Mupke discussions, and and um, you know, as everyone knows, I was a critic of that 
thing and did a lot of research. And, and I never, um, in all the research that I did, I never saw in the student housing of the type that they're building now, I never saw any complaints against the capstone management while they were managing. The problem arises when they sell the property, that, you know, they have a certain financial formula. Kane Anderson, their equity partner, makes the decision, not, not Capstone directly. And so, me, and I assume that it's, I don't know what it is, but I assume that it's tied to depreciation of the equipment that they install in all of the, uh, you know, the apartments, uh, the washers, dryers, uh, you know all the things for the utilities, and so when these when these things <coughs> click, and then the certain formula hits, you know all things align, the cogs align perfectly. Then they decide to sell, and that's when the man and they no longer manage, and they you know they they stated that well no we'll, we'll probably keep managing, maybe they will, but it'd be a first because in 100 percent of all of the cases where they have sold a property. And they always sell a property like the one that they're building. The ones they keep are the suburban style, uh, little chalet type things that are spread out over a uh, large acreage. The, the concentrated ones they always sold 100%, and in 100% they no longer manage. So, but they do a good job when they're managing. The problem comes when they turn it over to the new owners, hire a new management company. And in case after case, every single one I researched, I didn't research every single one of them, all 24, um, the quality of the management goes down. Evidently, they want to increase their, um, you know, the profits. So um, they, they don't pay attention to tenants' complaints. Tenant satisfaction plummets. And so... Um, Repairs aren't made. The, physically, the the uh, units start deteriorating, and um, just all kinds of problems arise because the new managers are taking all kinds of shortcuts, and that's case after case after case after case. So, um, you know, anything we decide to do, of course, would have to transfer to any new management. And I don't think it should just be for student housing. I think it should be for any large. George, would you like another round? Yes, I would, please. Mike? Thank you, Mayor. I don't get to say this very often, but I really kind of like the Corvallis approach from what I saw. <clears throat> um, I, I, at least it was in, very intriguing, the idea that, because we, when we had public testimony on the social host ordinance, one of the things that we heard from students was that the fourth time visited the fine was fairly excessive and burdensome. <clears throat> the Corvallis approach there has the creating a, you know, at, at that fourth time, the property is no longer usable, which puts both the, uh, the tenant and the, and the owner in, uh, in the position of having a, a dog in that fight, I would think, and, and being teammates to work something out. So I, uh, I wonder, what are, the, what are the pros and cons from what your, uh, your knowledge base on that is for, the, for that approach? I'd be interested to know. Corvallis was one of the communities that jumped out at us as well. What I'm going to do is take those questions and I'm going to respond yeah. so that I don't give you all the pros and cons right here, but that's, that's something fine. we'll look into. I'd, I'd really be interested to know how that's worked out for them <clears throat> when they put that into place and how well that's worked, if there have been any significant problems from that or lawsuits, if there were, you know, if there are any particularly good stories about how well that worked for, and made people work together. That's very interesting to me. So I have in the queue, I have Claire, Chris, and Alan. Claire. All right. Uh, thanks for this thorough uh, briefing. I'm still, you know, playing catch up, so I don't know necessarily all the dynamics at play with what we were looking at here. But my assumption is we were more concerned maybe about um, behavior issues spilling out into the neighbors rather than maintenance of the property itself. Is that, uh, is that an accurate evaluation? Okay. Um, I, I guess one thing that strikes me is the issue of absentee landlords and do we have any kind of requirement for property owners that live out of state who lease or rent to be registered with the city or any entity so they can be contacted? 
to my knowledge, we don't have anything like that. And that came up as the local agent that other communities are using. In fact, most of the other communities that I looked at had something like that. Yeah. We don't have a, I mean, we don't have the specific item, I think, that they have done in Aurora. Was it Aurora that had that? But um, our rental housing program requires property owners to register with us and pay a, a per year fee. So we have all of their contact information for the owners, whether they're in state or out of state. So in effect, we have that registration have, requirement right now. I mean, we have a way of knowing who owns a particular property that's we currently being rented. We collect the fee, and so through that, we have their information. It's not the same kind of licensing registration that they've done in other communities. It's just we have their contact information. Right. So, I mean, my feeling is that I don't know that we would need to require an in-state or in-county person be attached to every single rental, but I think it's important that the city be able to contact landlords, property owners who are not local. Um, so that's good to know. I think any um, kind of ordinance uh, or system that we set up, my preference would be that it be as uniform as possible, that it treat student housing no differently from senior housing or non-specified housing, that it treats small rental units, whether they're single housing uh, you know, single-family housing or multiple units the same, as much as is practically possible given whatever particulars we might come up with. But I think that's, uh, I think that's really important that we're not setting up one group to be discrim feeling discriminated against versus, and also I would say it should ap apply to existing properties as well as new properties. I, th I, I wouldn't support something that just applied to new developments. That doesn't seem fair. Okay, thank you. Chris. Thank you. Um, actually, I think Claire teed up a lot of the questions really well. Um, that w for me, there's the issues regarding the condition. You know, what do we want to do to regulate the condition of the actual property? And then there's the other set of issues around the behavior of the tenants. And, and I agree. We have a rental housing code, which my impression is is primarily the place you go to talk about the condition of the facility. So there's no point in duplicating the rental housing code in terms of what is dealing. So I, then I will now focus on the behavior side, which is, I think, what we really want to talk about. And so, one, behavior is something that is not just unique to students. Behavior is unique to anyone. I mean, I could conceive seniors getting drunk and, you know, running naked through their front yard. Yeah, this is Eugene. This is, <laughs> could be, could happen. And so you want something that applies equally to everyone. Um, and also, whether you've lived in your building for 20 years or you just moved in, you could still get drunk and run naked through your front yard. So I think it should apply to all, all facilities. Um, and, and the reason why I'm focusing in on behaviors, I think that is the touch point that most people are concerned about. And so it would be helpful to be able to talk about what are those behaviors that are creating the greatest concern. I mean, the social host ordinance that we're talking about is at its core essentially a behavior um, element. So there is perhaps a nexus between those two um, that could be that could be explored in terms of how they could interrelate and not duplicate each other. Um, and I think that and I think the whole question of do you need local management? Does it need to be on-site management? Does it need to be physically in the building? Are all elements that I don't know for sure what the solution is because um, I've heard anecdotally that sometimes. The, the behavior problems that you'll have in student housing is because the on-site manager is getting drunk and inviting friends over to parties. Um, so you need to be able to, to be clear that you can control the behavior um, through effective mechanisms and not just one that you automatically think is going to be the right one. Um, and so who you bring into that discussion, I think, could be a real critical component. Um, there's some real world experience out there in terms of how you can really manage behavior effectively. But um, I think this is going in the right direction. I like I, actually a lot of these examples here. Um, if we think residential management was the solution, um, we could definitely go there, but I would want to look and see, has that worked every time? Is it foolproof or does it really get at the problems we're talking about? But um, I like where it's going and I think those, you know, what kind of behaviors we want to control would be for me a very important part of the conversation. Alan? Thanks for those great visuals. <laughs> That's going to be stuck in my head a while. Uh, Nan, in the future, if you could do two slides per page, that would be very oh, helpful and okay. easier to read. Um, my experience is that uh, the properties in the area that I live in town, the properties with on-site management are less problematic for the neighborhood. Um, and, and they also have lower uh, vacancy rates. And 
that's been told to me by numerous people, uh, not not necessarily landlords, but but uh, people around the, around the neighborhood, especially in the South University neighborhood, where they see see the vacancy signs and kind of track this on a lot more intensive level than I do, and all any of us do. Um, the problem is is the impact on neighborhood livability, and that's the behavior and the noise issues. And uh, but the ancillary benefit of that is that my experience also is that pro on-site property management actually the condition of the facility is better as well so I can get that as an added bonus um, I was I, I hadn't thought about this but did you bring up an uh, on-site versus live-in and and what's that distinction and that's a distinction that I, I was went looking for that so some folks have somebody who's there on site but they're working on site and in some they're working on site all night but they're not necessarily living there but some actually have people that live there. That the distinction um, more often the live-in goes with the student housing, and the non-live-in just on site goes with non-student housing. But Broadway Place is an exception because they have somebody living there, and they're not primarily for students, although students live there. So when they have on-site management, that's usually typical work hours. Yeah, it could be. It doesn't have to be. It could be evening hours too. And are they typically maintenance people? No, um, the maintenance people I think do. They don't. They're not there all the time. They're maybe called in or they're essentially on call. But the on-site management is more like they have an office on site. There's somebody to talk to. Um, and I saw some examples where they were available. They kept office hours, um, regular office hours, but not just the eight to five kind of thing. But they didn't actually live there. Uh, what we did hear from uh, we called a couple of local property developers and said, "Do you have live-in?" And the student housing developers said, yes, we have live-in. And the non-student housing said no because it limited who got that job. They wanted a, If they wanted a professional, they didn't necessarily want somebody that just wanted to live with students. So it had to do with who would be available for that job, who would be interested. So there is a distinction between on-site management and live-in management. So when they're just on-site and they don't live there, right. what are their duties? They would be available if there's a problem. They would, they, and, um, and for some of them, they're not the same as the people that you call if you want to lease the property. When I called the Pearl on Paradigm, um, I'm sorry, the Paradigm on Pearl, um, that individual lives there, but um, typically he said with Von Klein, which is one of the larger property managers in Eugene, um, he, an individual like that, might live, say, in the Pearl, but also manage another one that doesn't have a live in. Um, doesn't doesn't give over a unit um, to the person there. So uh, primarily there for complaints could be behavior complaints. It could be condition complaints. Mm -hmm. And and I can also see that the size of the properties or the number of units that we look at, we could have actually two different types of models. One where you have maybe on site during certain hours if the if for smaller units and then maybe live in for larger units um, in terms of number of units <clears throat> my preference is is to to uh, engage as many of these properties as possible so smaller la rather than larger I and mean, capstone was how many units uh, about 350 350 units yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's units, not beds. Uh, and, and that's another one I was going to bring up. So some of these have five beds per unit. And so it's a, it, there's a number of people, too. And I think that's something we need to investigate a little bit more. Um, some are built two, three, four, five bedrooms in some cases. So it's, uh, you can have a smaller number of units and have more number than of people with, that have a different setup. Uh, and I think it's the number of people that we really want to get at as opposed to the number of units. Um, I agree that uh, it should be on all properties, not just new properties, so existing. Um, that would be city-wide rather than just, for instance, the university area. Uh, for just the university area, downtown Capstone wouldn't be in that area. Um, I, I don't think you can segregate <coughs> off a section of town and, ha and, and do this with. Um, the, the, the thing that struck me, uh, like to talk a little bit more about the remedies and the enforcement. There's a bunch of different kinds of models here about what happens in these unruly. Uh, what another round? Uh, that's the question I have. Okay. The last question. Go ahead. But yeah, I did have another round. All right. Do you want to 
to her to get back the to different you. types of remedies sure. and enforcement. Okay, some of um, some of the remedies are fines. Um, for example, I think it was Corvallis that had a fine per day. Um, some of them, you uh, lose your uh, permit to rent your uh, units out. So um, I think what I'd like to do is is actually bring you back a table of what's the offense and what's the remedy okay. because they um, quite a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. how the, how it gets That's definitely. Good. That's good. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, since this will be the last time I have a chance to talk about it, could you put me down for three rounds? <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a couple of comments. Alan, Alan brought up some points that I, uh, that I was going to make regarding the size of the unit and different models of management that are used based upon the size of the, size of the unit. But first, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Brown for the diligent work that he put into this. He did a lot of research on his own personal time dug into it pretty deeply, and he's able to speak authoritatively and conclusively about what he has witnessed. And as the discussion moves forward at the council level, I'm certain that uh, Councillor Brown is going to be able to provide details of, of where thing, uh, as it becomes necessary, of where it happened and how it happened, and, uh, and more specifically, um, uh, what could have been done to, uh, to mitigate the issues that he brings up as management changes uh, from from ownership to, uh, to um, from the uh, from the builders to the new owners. So I look forward to hearing that, and I'll be watching more or less from a distance on that. But thanks, George, for. How far it's in this room too. It's true. <laughs> right. <It was> six <laughs> feet. <laughs> but once again, thanks, George, for putting the time into that. And uh, the uh, the different management models. I I suspect that you have. Uh, collected data from the different communities that you've looked at regarding the size of the units, or the, the numbers of units inside the projects, and how different management uh, management uh, models are applied. And I'm certain the council will be interested in seeing very specific information on that as they move forward. Um, and then one thing that really is intriguing to me is that a number of the communities that you, that you have listed uh, engage or employ some form of permitting. and. Uh, and permitting seems to be a, a pretty valuable tool in that uh, per you don't have to – the per permitting, uh, uh, um, permitting conditions can change based upon as, – as conditions change. So you don't have to go into a great deal of depth to change the permitting requirements as you move forward with, with new permitting requirements. My question is, uh, in the communities that you, uh, that you surveyed, is permitting always done by the city or is it sometimes done by the university? I didn't come across any examples that were done by the university. Okay. I came across some cooperative agreements where the university is aware of what the city is doing, but generally the rental license permitting process came through the city. Okay. It, it seems to me that the permitting process, the permitting concept would be a good one because you could, uh, uh, in the signed permit agreement, uh, the, the tenants, uh, excuse me, the, the landlords would have uh, specific uh, and changing modified uh, requirements as as uh, different conditions arise uh, as long as it's, you know, it would be done judiciously and then uh, permitting also could contain um, any any form of uh, any form of uh, penalties for for um, for non-compliance and additionally the uh, the death penalty um, which you uh, <laughs> mentioned in Corvallis <laughs> Um, just a couple of comments I'll make, and then we have George in the second round. Um, I think the management issue is about uh, someone who's accessible and responsible. So however that's achieved, um, someone that's, that's accessible and responsible. On site, nearby, but it can't be, I'm, I don't answer at night, and it can't be those kinds of, of things. And um, I just wanted to make a point, and because um, I think we do have this conversation around uh, some of the uh, interface issues between um, student housing and, and community. But I also want to point out that the reason to solve this is the same as it is in the rest of the community, is that you want people to live in healthy and healthy and safe environments, and that includes students as well. So when we um, 
talk about the safety and well-being of people out in the neighborhoods, I think we have to bear in mind that uh, some of the partying that goes on isn't very health or healthy or safety, safe for the students involved either. So you have uh, those same kind of reasons to drive your decision making in in both cases. And I fear sometimes we don't uh, make clear that. Uh, our students live here amongst us and our citizens too and we have a responsibility for their safety and well-being and that we make de uh, decisions that uh, uh, support that as much as as possible and then I like the, the uh, good neighbor policy and I appreciate that the university is doing it I just don't know why we don't <laughs> and I, I, I think we could learn from them and perhaps share uh, a good neighbor policy with our expectations for how people live in multi-unit dwellings through throughout the community and if, uh, and do it in a way that's not uh, costly for us but but I think it's I think it's a shared value there too and then uh, when we heard from students I just want to say that they I don't know what we do about it with a lack of information I don't know but I heard them multiple times express fear of using the rental code and a fear that if they used it that they would lose their housing which is already hard for them to get because many of them can't afford the new more expensive units and so they're all in these uh, multiple living situations and sometimes in not very good situations and they and they're afraid to do anything about it so I don't know what we do about that and I don't know how uh, extensive that is but I heard uh, the ASUO students say that uh, many of them so I think that's an important thing for us to bear in mind is what, is what we're doing that successfully really being successful for everybody. And, um, and then one of the other, the other issue that uh, is tangential to this, but I wanted to bring it up because we were trying to move that too, is that do we treat all multi-units the same in the code? And we have a push from our neighbors that say perhaps we should not be uh, treating all uh, multi-unit dwellings the same in the code. I don't know the answer to that. George, you're next. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah, it's a little complicated. We there, There's so many interesting um, ideas here. It's, it's hard to know today which ones to pull out and, and perhaps weave together and, and adopt, maybe, um, for our town. Um, but I would like to just reiterate something the mayor just said is is this is one thing that I came across quite a bit was, uh, and this is all around the country, it's not, not just here, is, is lack of landlord response to two problems. And then, and then the, new, the new landlords, the new, the new owners. And then um, occasionally um, seemed to be so common it had to be kind of a business plan to somehow um, deprive, think of ways to deprive the tenants of their security deposits and their cleaning deposits and things like that. Now, of course, most people don't do that here in town. Most landlords, I think, are are very responsible. And um, just as I think most tenants are. <laughs> but not everyone is, and that's why we have to work on stuff like this. So I, I think that um, no matter what we come up here, I think it would be a good idea to, to, you know, for landlords to have copies for themselves to read, but also provide copies to any new tenant of the social host ordinance and the rental housing code, which kind of define, you know, their responsibilities, the tenants, and also their remedies. If, if things aren't working so well for them, they would have a copy of the, of the rental code. And, and as long as, you know, there was a clear understanding of the tenants, and the landlords of duties and responsibilities and benefits, then, um, but but make it uniform. I mean, like really do it. Like, actually have copies at, at the manager's office. And okay, here here's the lease. Let's go over that. Okay, here's the the rental housing code. This kind of defines your remedies if we if we mess up. And then here's the social host ordinance. This is what's expected. And. These are the penalties, and it's very simple to avoid those penalties. Um, so I'm just curious, um, does the U of O have a, a kind of like a vacant housing list, like the University of Minnesota in Duluth? Do we? I don't think I've that the U of O one. does. I think that the uh, student, the um, ASU may have one. Uh -huh. um, but I do think that the U of O has the good neighbor policy that they hand out. 
Right, right. Okay, well. I, I, well, no, I, I, you know, I, we, we, I just need to look at this more. I'm, I don't think we can ever require a live-in manager for smaller units. I think it's, you know, it would be uh, economically uh, hard. For instance, your, your multi-unit, if you have four units, and to require someone, okay, one of those has to be a live-in manager. That's 25% of, you know, your... <laughs> your income right there off right off the top I think for larger units like say the capstone one of them is going to be 700 people the other one's 500 yeah I think live-in is which they plan to do anyway but but I think it should be a requirement for Thanks. large ones he last up I think Alan Fire. okay and we're gonna try to we've got about three minutes here yeah um, I just wanted to reiterate uh, something that the mayor said which is the comment about the student housing uh, um, and and when we met with the U of ASUO Senate, and many times when I met with students, they often and we talk about this issue. They often uh, talk about the fear of using the rental housing code, and I think that partly becomes they don't have any experience with it, and partly becomes the fact that they're new to being a renter. And it might be their first time, and so they don't understand how all this works. And um, and and once it's explained, and that that. Their, their fears kind of go away because uh, uh, it really doesn't happen the way that they think it would happen in terms of retaliation. Um, the, also, the, the mayor talked about the housing, and it's not just students. One of the most interesting things of the Envision Eugene things that we got was the chart that showed where all the student housing is in the city, and it was, as you'd think, uh, there was a big chunk of it right around the university, but it was spread out all over the city. So students are everywhere in, in, the, in, in Eugene, so it's not just around the university area. Um, I think the accessible and responsible thing is really an important part in the way to define this because the neighbors uh, often uh, hear stories from neighbors about uh, who they don't know who to call and if, they, and, and if it's an out-of-state Landlord, they don't know how to get in contact with them. If they do get in contact with them, nothing happens, and that's that's the frustration that gets done with this. And so the social host ordinance and this uh, uh, on-site uh, management both come out of that livability working group ideas that have been talked about for the last couple of years. So this is, these are two of the tools that have been talked about for a long time. Um, one of the things when we do bring back research is, is the administrative cost of enforcement and, and the remedies. Um, like the, the Corvallis is interesting, but I would think that it was very high, it had high administrative costs and whether or not we're set up to do, respond to these kind of things within that context of nuisance enforcement. I, I know our nuisance enforcement is, uh, efforts is pretty limited. We only have a couple of people working on it, if, if that, and, and uh, oftentimes it's very difficult. And, and then we also have, in, the, in that context, we often do uh, a letter, a letter, and then some kind of enforcement, and that might not fit this way for this particular one. Um, the U vote does have a good neighbor policy. They try to give that out to uh, all, all the new students. That's all the hotline you can call if, if you think if you, you've got some issues around that. So um, the U vote does do quite a bit of that. They're not responsible for people's housing once you get off campus. They're they're focused on the student uh, dorms, and then once you get off campus, uh, the. The, the, they don't really deal with it at all, and um, and and that brings back kind of the student code of conduct issues. That once you leave campus, the student code of conduct is silent, and there's nothing about the, the, the off-campus behavior or anything around around things once you leave the property. And that's one thing we need to work on in this in the context of this. So. There, thank you, Mayor. Uh, could we get a copy of the U of O's good neighbor um, policy? Um, and I see uh, right Greg shaking his head no when you said <laughs> things don't uh, apply off campus. So there might be some provision in there for once students are off campus so we could see that. Um, Councillor Farr's comments about permits um, interested me as well. I'm not super familiar with how permitting works, how it's administered, but um, it seems like it could be an opportunity to um, accommodate different kinds of housing within one permitting process so depending on how many units or how many beds a different criteria might apply I wouldn't necessarily support the idea of some very prescriptive solutions like requiring live-in management um, but perhaps they could uh, 
be offered uh, an array of options of how they might get at the solution that we are seeking for their particular property. Um, and then also I think the permitting process is that also an opportunity to provide training and support to property managers. Um, so that would be important. Um, and does our rental housing program have any of those kinds of support systems right now? No. Yeah. I don't think we do training. We, we don't do any training. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think those are some things we could enhance, add value for the property managers themselves as well as helping um, with, you know, neighborhood compatibility and some of the issues. So that's what I wanted to ask. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. And... Uh Let's uh, wrap this one up and move on to our second item. Thanks, Nan, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item is the work session on uh, Sustainability Commission Work Plan and Annual Report. Houston City Manager, when you're ready. Just waiting for our guests and staff to the table. And I'll be turning over to you, babe, to make introductions. And Great. Thank you. Babe O'Sullivan, Sustainability Liaison through the City Manager's Office. I'm joined here today by Kathy Jaworski, the Chair of the Sustainability Commission, and Steve Newcomb, our Vice Chair. <clears throat> I wanted to start um, and take a few minutes just to set the context for the discussion today by reviewing the, the work of the Commission and its structure and then turn it over to Kathy to uh, share with you more about the work plan that's before us today. I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, another Commissioner in the audience, and that's Howie Annette. Thanks for joining us, Howie. So today, um, ev like this time every year, we come to uh, City Council with two goals in mind. One is to present the annual report and review the work of the Commission uh, between July 1st and June 30th of this prior year. And then secondly, to um, review and approve the uh, fiscal year 13 work plan that starts as of July 1 of, of uh, 2012. So those are our goals today. As I mentioned, I'm going to start just with a brief overview of the Commission to kind of set the stage for the conversation. So by way of review, the Sustainability Commission has been with us since 2007 when it was created. It's a, an advisory board that includes 13 members, each serving four-year terms. A unique way of appointing them, we have eight uh, commissioners that are appointed directly by City Council members, four that are appointed at large, and one who serves as council liaison, in this case, Councillor Zelenka. Uh, myself and uh, Matt McCray in the sustainability office provide staff support, as does the city manager's office at large. The function of the group is really to look at policy, uh, providing policy advice to council and the city manager in the initiation or development of programs that will create or enhance sustainable practices within the community, so a fairly broad charge for this group. Let's turn our attention first to the work that was done up through June 30th, uh, reporting out on some of the results. It was a very um, productive year, particularly the second half for the Commission. Um, the themes that they continue to work on um, that should sound familiar, uh, attention to both land use and transportation initiatives and, and where those intersect, uh, continuing attention to climate change, energy conservation, food policy, et cetera. Those were all on the, the work plan for this past year. It was a very productive year, as I mentioned. You may remember receiving s several missives from the Commission over the course of the last several months. A few highlights to share. Um, we brought forward the results of the Coordinated Land Use and Transportation Action Committee, otherwise known as CLUTAC. Mm -hmm. It was a, a joint venture of the Sustainability Commission and the Planning Commission looking specifically at the triple bottom line impacts of the proposed uh, MX route in West Eugene. Um, some other things that you heard from the Commission about including included feedback on Envision Eugene. Uh, the pedestrian bicycle master plan, food initiatives, and then a couple of issues that were not on their work plan uh, at the beginning but came on later, and that included coal trains and the capstone project. So quite a bit of feedback from the group over the course of the year. A few, um, a few areas we fell short of expectations, so I wanted to mention those as well. Um, there was ambition to uh, strengthen collaboration with the Human Rights Commission and the Neighborhood Leaders Council some progress was made there, but not quite as far as the work plan had aimed for. 
Also uh, fell a little bit short on some of the education and outreach uh, objectives as well as addressing economic and social equity considerations in their, in their various focus areas. Today we've got a commission with one vacancy due to one of your <laughs> council <laughs> members here. Quit. 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 Um, but there's been a few other changes that I wanted to point out. There, there was quite a bit of turnover, as you know, as we experienced with a number of our commissions. Um, but this year we had both leadership changes and turnover in the members of the of the commission. So um, earlier this year we lost uh, Josh Scove and Josh Bruce. They termed out, and uh, in exchange we got the leadership of Kathy Jaworski as chair and Steve Newcomb as vice chair. So. Um, nice advancement there. Uh, we also had four new members, all women in this case, appointed over the last um, few months. Those included um, uh, Sarah Mazey, uh, Sasha Luftig, Don Leslie, and Claire Surrett. So uh, in addition to that, we had three reappointed commissioners, including Kathy Jaworski, Howie Bennett, and Sean Bowles. So let's talk about the work plan that's before you today. A few highlights I wanted to share, uh, but then I'll be turning it over to Kathy Jaworski to tell you more about it. First of all, it's obviously a wide range of topics and activities that's accounted for in this work plan. In fact, when I did a quick count, it's a few more than they proposed last year. So uh, it's an ambitious set of topics. Um, but they, they represent some real opportunities uh, for the sustainability Sustainability Commission to have meaningful input. The bulk of the work plan really reflects their involvement in continuing ongoing city initiatives, goals, and investments. So for example, Envision Eugene continues to be uh, a target for them as well as transportation investments and planning that's going on through the transportation system plan or the work of the um, street repair review um, committee. Uh, they're also focused uh, on regional collaboration. That was a theme last year as well, and there's some real opportunity to do that through the Lane Livability Consortium. So they're looking to plug in there. And um, so there's a wide variety of these activities that are on the work plan that are, are closely tied to ongoing um, initiatives with the city. But I do need to point out there are some new things as well. Um, you'll see those in, in a minute. I have a slide to highlight those. Um, where I wanted to to end this part of the conversation though was to just mention that with with internal review within the city manager's office as we saw this work plan developing there has been some concern about staff capacity and budget resources to support some of these ambitious goals and I would just like to say that I think it's going to necessitate some candid conversations between commission leadership and council about how we can move forward on some of the the work plan items and some of the recommendations that may come out of those work plan items. And I don't think we're going to see the Commission shy away from those conversations. It's just something that we'll have to confront as, as we go forward. I wanted to just break out some of the work plan items for your attention. Uh, they fall generally into three groups, I'd say. The first one is around participation. There's a real emphasis this year on having sustainability measures <coughs> embedded directly in the activities uh, uh, that are reflected in their work plan. So for example, with the triple bottom line work, they're interested in participating directly in some analysis that's going on with the Lane Livability Consortium and the develop development and refinement of some new triple bottom line tools. Um, similarly, with the transportation system plan and the pedestrian bicycle master plan, we have a number of commissioners that are directly involved and have served on those, those working groups. Another group of activities focus on tracking progress and monitoring and, and advising council on, on progress being made. And so again, a number of these are, are initiatives already underway, uh, continuing work on 20 minute neighborhoods, um, how we're implementing the internal climate action plan, uh, the next round of advocacy for the MX system. And then the last group I would call explore and investigate. Th these are some of those new items that I mentioned a few minutes ago where the commission is interested in looking at some new initiatives. Uh, one that would focus on sustainable business practices, which of course harkens back to the original work of the Sustainable Business Initiative. Uh, there's an interest in, 
in doing a scan of, of business activities and how city practices can either encourage or discourage the adoption of sustainable business practices. Likewise, the Commission is interested in looking at uh, the possibility of a carbon fee and doing some investigation around that. And finally, uh, this is a theme again from last year, regional collaboration and planning, particularly around climate mitigation and adaptation. And there's some real opportunities for doing that this year. So with that brief overview, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy Jaworski, Chair of the Commission, to continue the conversation with you. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. OK. Um, so thanks for having us here today. I think we're a little later in the year than, than sometimes we are, because you guys have been busy, as have we. So um, we're appreciative of being able to be here now. And it gave us more time to come up with more things for our work plan. Um, I've been on the commission, I think, since 2000, sometime in 2009. Um, and I became the chair in July, officially, I guess, um, for a couple months before that, um, I was acting chair. And um, it's an honor and an exciting time to be part of the Sustainability Commission and think we've gone through the sort of starting up period and um, trying to figure out exactly where we could add value. And a number of the sort of founding members are have reached the end of their term or, or are reaching the end of their term. So um, a lot of our planning for this year was looking at, OK, at this point in time, uh, given what we've learned, what is really the most important way that we can add value for the city, add value to your work as city council. Um, over the past year, I, I, uh, Babe mentioned our missives. Um, I think that uh, when we look at sort of our, our accomplishments of the past year, I think that the Sustainability Commission weighed in on, on all of the various policy issues that we targeted weighing in for, for you, and a couple of others that we didn't target. Um, I'd love to get feedback from you as part of this conversation as far as how useful those, those, that input is and how we can be even more effective at providing it at the right time for you. Um, one of the biggest challenges was really the moving target of dates for various things on which we were to advise. Um, that I think will probably continue to be the case, but it was a challenge trying to figure out the timing of, of how we work with you. Um, Another challenge that we've tried to address through this work plan this year is trying to get some overall cohesion to our work plan. There are so many, as Babe mentioned, there are so many issues and ways of working on um, sustainability. I mean, that's such a big, big issue. So we, we do have some thematic organization of our work plan and um, really want to work in two ways, um, both advising you on policy and directly engaging with the community so that when we speak, you know we're speaking um, in a way that's rooted in lots of relationships and not lots of networks of people who are working on this, this, these kinds of issues in the community. Um, our hopes for this coming year, um, we have great new commission members, great old commission members, um, new energy, and we want to continue to, to move forward. Um, at our planning retreat this summer, um, the commissioners uh, made personal um, pledges to, in to commit more time, uh, each of us, to the work of the Sustainability Commission um, so that we can have more impact. We know that our staff is really limited um, and the issues that we're working on are very important and they don't seem to be getting smaller. So um, if you notice in the public meeting notice section of the the website and the newspaper, you'll see a lot more subcommittee work on behalf of the commission. And um, we're going to be ramping up what we're doing this year as, as the volunteer side of, of, of the commission's work. And as Babe mentioned, the impacts on that uh, in terms of staff, we hope to be able to minimize those. But um, as we go forward during the year, we will continue to have a conversation about um, how that's impacting and how we can do more as volunteers and if things need to come off the work plan to make good choices about that. But we're really excited about everything that's in the work plan. Um, some of the some of the activities are, it's a big, big work plan. Some of them are much more intensive than others. We went through a process of trying to look at what were our expectations of how much time various things would take. So the first five items we thought were time intensive. The other items are less time intensive and can be done in bits and pieces uh, throughout the year. Um, let's see. I don't know as I need to walk through the 
whole work plan because you've had a chance to read it. So I think at this point, um, just want to emphasize our commitment as commissioners to taking on the big issues that need to be taken on, to having a set of things we're continuing to monitor, a set of things we're directly participating in, a set of things we're exploring, um, to emphasize our personal commitment to um, engage the whole community, um, to pay attention to both sides, what we're hearing from the community as well as what we're conveying to you. Um, and to make a difference in the coming year. So at this point, perhaps just entertain questions that you might have of any particular items. Is there anything I should add at this point, Steve? Steve is a sage nodder this year as I was last year with Josh <laughs> Gove. It's, an, it's a very honored role. <laughs> well, um, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you, especially to you two, but, and of course to Babe, but I also want to thank the whole commission for their continued hard work and um, you know I guess we can thank you for for Claire too right I mean you lose, <laughs> you lose. that wasn't a choice <laughs> I know <laughs> but you'll have to find another woman yes. <laughs> I like the, the fact that we're getting more women on the sustainability commission I think it's an important balance in all of our committees and commissions along with other balances so appreciate that and uh, um, for my part, I appreciate the uh, work you're doing. I just, uh, Alan, I know is on is our representative, and he's going to be up first to make some comments. But I did want to say that uh, as I listened to you, one of the things that I I, I know how um, hard it is for us to try to do everything that we're trying to do, and uh, the pressures it puts on everybody, both volunteer and the staff. So I I understand, and I I want you to know I appreciate that, and I appreciate that it, your ambitions are. Are large and that's that's great because it's a it's a very big challenge um, I just want to say as much as you can uh, help stimulate things happen but don't feel like you have to do them all yes that's so that's a different um, level of role and and hard to find the right way to do that but important to do that because um, as we infuse what we want to get done and every every part of us and not only as a city organization but out into the broader community you can't be everywhere and you can't be touching everything so it's going to be important to figure out how to be part of helping things get going and helping to sort of track them a little bit but you don't have to have your hands in everything and um, and then I think it's really important for your uh, commission members to each feel like uh, their contributions have actually move the dial a little bit and so however you try to find a way to make sure that happens I think that keeps them energized and, and feeling like the am amazing amount of time they give is is valuable time that they gave and resulted in some real good things for the community anything any way we can help with that please please ask excellent Alan thanks mayor um, I just want to acknowledge the great work done by Babe here and all, and also Matt McRae. Uh, without them, the things that have happened so far wouldn't have been possible. And also acknowledge the leadership of Kathy and, and nodding Steve. Uh, <laughs> and, and especially to the outgoing chair, Josh Scove, who um, did a fantastic job and actually left really big shoes to fill. Uh, and, and, and so um, he, Josh is no longer on the commission. He was replaced by Don Wesley as my representative. Um, we have some really great new members with great new energy, and uh, we'll even get some more new ones uh, coming up. And uh, I think you know, the last two pages with the excru excruciatingly small font was the um, – <laughs> Was the what we? Your eyes, I Alan, yeah. I mean, I have bifocal <laughs> contacts, so I can read it, but I'm sure some people can't. Um, small, but not excruciating. Yeah, exquisitely small. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the uh, we did accomplish quite a bit this last year, and um, and and so that, I think that shows in that those last few pages. But uh, I also wanted to comment on the retreat that we did. We did it on a Saturday, and people came and, and, and spent their time doing that on a Saturday uh, uh, morning. And, 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 and also on the, on the work plan format. Uh, this is a little different than the other formats that we get. I think it's very useful from my perspective as a counselor of how to use it and what's happening, what they're going to do, and how they're going to use it. And I think it's also really valuable for the uh, 
for the, the, the commissioners uh, on the Sustainability Commission. I think it might be a format that might be a good model for other, other boards and commissions. Um, it's really extensive. It's really ambitious. Uh, it's very aggressive. And of course, we already talked about the issues of staff support around this. You know, the commission only gets about a percentage of your time, babe. 10 to 20 10 on to 20. any given week. Yeah, it depends. Um, uh, the issue we had was narrowing this <laughs> down. I mean, this is how extensive this is. There was a bunch of things that didn't get on this list uh, because sustainability is such a broad topic. And uh, But I think it reflects how active and uh, how much the folks on the commission want to make a difference. Um, and, and they took to heart a lot of the things that we did, in particular that the city did, in particular the, the, the recent climate change poll uh, that's reflected, I think, in, in number four, the, the climate fee, uh, when in that poll result, 77% of people in Eugene thought climate change was real and human cause. 71% believed it had long-term impacts that would be catastrophic. And 78% thought we need a much stronger regulation for greenhouse gases and to prevent climate change. And I think that gets woven in here, and I think they, the commissioners took that to heart. But it not only focused on the city and the regional planning things that we're doing, but also on the business community. And in particular, the third one, the, the sustainable practices, uh, where it actually is targeting the community and the business community, uh, and, and the business community in particular. So uh, having been involved in this, uh, I think it's a good work plan. I encourage your approval. George Brown is next, followed by Claire. Thanks, Mayor. Well, yeah, it certainly is an ambitious plan, and there's, there's a lot to work out on there. Um, I just had a couple questions um, about the carbon fee. Um, it's the this description is investigate revenue neutral fee on greenhouse gas emissions. Could you just speak a little bit about that? Do you want to speak? Who, who would be involved? Who who would be have to pay the fee? Don't know who would decide. I don't know any of that yet. Um, the uh, the I the genesis of that this idea came from really the the fact that that of the climate change um, the survey that people were asking for some bigger bolder ideas to address what is a uh, increasingly increasing awareness of of a different kind of cliff I guess that we're facing as a as a society um, and uh, carbon fees are uh, oftentimes they'll be on the cost of gasoline or some kind of fuel and and one of the questions we've had at the um, commission level, so what's the right scale to do that at? Can a city actually do anything, or does it have to be regional, or is it statewide? And knowing that it's an issue, what leadership could Eugene provide at what level, in what kind of model, um, to start addressing this big issue, as opposed to the incremental changes that we're, we're often talking about? We don't really know more. I mean, there are municipal examples. There are state or province level examples. There are national examples. Um, but we really, it's really an exploratory piece to look at what are the things, how might they compare to what we have, what would be the pros and cons that we would bring back in terms of recommendations. So it's really a first step. Um, it's not unheard of in other places, but we don't know how it fits here. And in fact, right. previous to that, the the work the the committee that Chris and I were on to look at uh, street bond re or street revenues, how to fix the streets, the fixing the streets revenue committee. What do we call that committee? I forget. That is a we looked source? at about thirty one different things, one of which was a carbon fee, and there were a bunch of issues around that that needed to be resolved before we could. Uh, so we put that on the table because it was just too complicated for what we were trying to accomplish with the street fees. Yeah. But that was a good starting point. We did a lot of research, so that's some of the stuff we'll be starting with at the beginning of it. And there were some good examples, and there's been more since we looked at that, which was several years ago. So, um, and, you know, there's quite a lot of issues around that, around who, how you would do it, how it would be revenue neutral, who would pay, if it's just right. Eugene, how does that work? Is it, will we help set up a statewide or regional model and things mm -hmm. like that? It's complicated. Yes. It's complicated. Yeah. But it deserves a uh, study. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it sounds like a very uh, great, yes, that sounds like a great research project. I was just curious about the general framework of it, I guess. And I just got a couple other, this other uh, item here I didn't quite understand. A work request, I guess that means work session requests. I don't know if that means of the council or of the commission, but current outstanding requests include sweat-free purchasing policy, environmental justice initiative, and 4J schools, and if you could just speak about those and the 
Yeah, we receive requests, as, as you do, from the public to take on various issues, to endorse them, to take some form of action. And uh, there, the three that are listed here are all current before us um, and we we haven't had a formal process for so how fast do we respond and and what if we think it belongs to another Commission's leadership they, um, we could be the catalyst for getting somebody else to do it um, so this is a two-part work plan item part one is getting a process in place for more systematically dealing with these things um, and secondly to clear out what we've got on the table and um, in terms of responding to those. So um, if there's further action that we recommend to City Council, that would come to you I that see. process. Okay. Well, just for my own enlightenment, what is the sweat-free purchasing policy? Uh, this is the first I've heard of it. I can speak to that just briefly. It's an initiative coming out of the Solidarity Network. They've approached the Commission a couple of different times about partnering on something like this. The basic notion would be to embed it in the city's purchasing policy so that um, uh, you're not purchasing from vendors that have been identified as using sweatshop labor. Sweatshops, okay. Yeah. And there's a, a website and database to support um, that research and information that you would need to make those decisions. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. It's great to see you guys here at the table. Thanks for taking time out of your day to come and speak to us about your work plan. And I thank Councillor Farr for my brief appointment to the um, <laughs> Sustainability Commission. I joined you all. I'm mad at you for quitting. Yeah, well, <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> so I only got to um, attend two meetings, I think, and unfortunately I couldn't attend the uh, retreat due to a work conflict, so I, I didn't get to participate as fully as I would have liked. But um, while I was there, I was definitely impressed with um, the work that you guys have taken on, who's uh, around the table, and how you're approaching your work. So I really thank you all and the folks who couldn't be here today for that. Um, but, uh, and I think your work plan is, is stellar, I, but I will offer my com uh, critique, which won't surprise you based on what I said around the table when I was on the commission, um, that I really think you need to look for ways to bolster the social equity aspect of the work um, around working conditions, wages, giving back to the community, and, you know, this is something that relates to the health of businesses as well, because they're not going to be able to do any of those things if they're not successful themselves. So I think there are bits and pieces within your current work plan where you might be able to bolster that piece, particularly around triple, the triple bottom line analysis, uh, sustain, when you're asking about sustainability practices, to not just look at environmental practices, but look at working conditions, um, democracy at work, those kinds of aspects as well, and just start to bring that more into your routine um, as you go forward so it doesn't become this thing sitting out here that you can't get to because you already have too much on your plate. Um, you know, if climate change is the, the major uh, catastrophe that's facing us, you know, how are we going to move folks into different kind of employment where they can still support their families and look forward to retirement while uh, moving out of unsustainable industries into more sustainable work? You know, I think we need to look at at that aspect as well. We can't forget about the human beings who are the reason we want to have a sustainable community. Um, and for my part, um, I'm assuming I'll have an opportunity at some point to uh, make an appointment to the commission. I will certainly look for someone who'd be willing to bring that perspective. I don't have any particular person in mind right now, but um, you know, I'll try and make that my commitment to the Sustainability Commission to help bolster that part of your work as well. But again, I think it's a good work plan. I think very thoughtful, um, building on good previous work, and I really thank you all for it. I would just uh, add to the, what Claire said and say that uh, one of the things that you guys could probably do is when you have openings, that you alert your council to what you think might, it might add to who's around the table. Uh, they don't have to take your advice, but you'll at least make them aware of what you think is missing in the, in the conversation. So when they're in the position to make appointments, they can look for somebody who might be able to bring some of that uh, that's, that's not currently there. From the, and I, I would say I, 
although of the people I know around the table, I, most of them I know have a lot of um, um, human um, services kind of um, uh, concerns, but I would also say sort of that uh, somebody who has that as a, as a priority would be kind of an asset to help in the, in the conversations too. So just those kind of balances to, to, to try to keep the, tr the, the thing you work on all the time, the triple bottom line, trying to keep all those pieces in, in play I th and giving us the best advice or, tweet or reminding us of things, I think, is, uh, is, would be really, really helpful. Can someone knocking on our door? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for the good of the order? Am I on the? Yeah, I just oh, I just add a your next. I'm so sorry. Uh, and I just wanted to add a couple on. things after. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, just uh, one comment. Uh, Claire mentioned the uh, triple bottom line. I think that um, a lot of the things that we do as a city should really focus upon the emphasis of the triple bottom line, mm -hmm. understanding that it is a triple bottom line, and that social equity certainly is always ha always has to be um, an element of it. At very difficult as it is to measure, and very difficult as it is to define. Um, the other one, obviously, on the Sustainability Commission is, uh, is environmental issues. And, uh, and I think that um, uh, I look forward to watching the balance that you achieve in the three, uh, the social equity, the environmental issues, and uh, additionally, in the economic side of, uh, of what sustainability can mean and, uh, and, uh, and how it does balance with, uh, with our need for a discussion that we had at the table last earlier this week which is uh, the prosperity of the community. Uh, we're looking for um, increasing in, in any way that we can um, within, the time, within the framework that we demand in this community, increasing the prosperity. And, uh, and I think that um, making certain that the, uh, the elements that sustainability can bring to the prosperity of the community are huge, almost immeasurable. But there will also be it would be very easy to slide onto the, into the other in the other direction um, by uh, by making it difficult for uh, more difficult for businesses to operate in the community. Now, I'm not suggesting that you back down on your on your work plan by any means, but uh, but always make certain that you keep an eye on the balance that uh, and the effect that. Uh, recommendations if they are accepted by this council, uh, the effect that they can have on the community. Based on that, I have a, a question maybe you can answer. Um, sustainability is something that is very local, very regional, and also global. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you discuss that? And more specifically, how much time do you spend on local versus, let's say, more global issues on the Sustainability Commission. Do you have a ratio you can give me? Like um, we spend 60% of our time local, 40%? I, I think we sp I mean, I would invite everybody here. I would say more, far more local. Like 80% uh -huh. local. Yeah. 80% local. Far more local. Um, the, uh, I think that the, the carbon uh, fee discussion is an example of some some and the regional col and the regional collaboration pieces of our work plan are examples of actually trying to make those broader connections more intentionally. But yeah, it's pretty much local. So the uh, the carbon fee then uh, ask a, um, a question too about that uh, following up on Councillor Brown. Um, the uh, the carbon fee would be based upon um, a. Uh, an industry or a, a local business based upon the fee would be charged to them based upon the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere is that or I know I heard you say that you don't know any yeah. much of this yet but but uh, certainly you're looking at things that have happened elsewhere is that the way it's handled in the areas that in it's handled places? a lot of different ways um, and it's still fairly new I think will if we do if we do something there will sure to be it will sure to be not exactly like anywhere else. Uh -huh. um, but it is, I mean, where it gets charged, how big the geography that it gets charged, who physically pays it, that's all part of why it's exploratory. Okay. Yeah. So, and you're in the very early stages of looking at that? Okay. Absolutely. I'll, I'll be intrigued to see the direction that that goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Based upon earlier statements that I've made, you know, that uh, 
uh, when you talk about a fee, somebody pays the fee. And now, of course, when we talk about release of carbon into the atmosphere, somebody pays that fee also. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah. that's the balance that you're achieving there. Exactly. Is, uh, yeah. Or they, or they don't pay it, but there's still a cost. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah. Well, they, and they, and by definition, we all pay it in, in the final outcome. So, and also note that it says investigate um, revenue neutral fee. I have till December 12th, Mayor. My time's not up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my gosh. We're going to be hearing about this. <laughs> Before you leave, <laughs> notice that it says investigate a revenue neutral fee. Um, revenue neutral means that the cost of the city would be offset by the payment made by the, the people. people. Yeah. yeah. Or, or somebody would be paying. Or I think community is a better way to think about it. Community would be around. The other thing to think about in this that I think is the um, um, that we have requirements coming to us from the state about uh, carbon emissions reductions that are that we are being asked to um, to respond to, and we have many places. And uh, Alan's worked on the greenhouse gas reduction piece of that for the for the state and the local. We have scenario planning that's been going on around transportation to try to see what we can do there. We had a discussion, uh, Pat, was that yesterday, about La Rapa and, and the work that they do to try to, so it's a, it's a, it's a, multi, it's a multi-pronged thing, but it's certainly uh, a, a responsibility that local communities like ours are being asked to undertake. And I know Portland's had a, I think they would be very familiar with that. They, they've done a lot of work and there are some studies done. I don't know if the carbon fee is, is one of those, but they actually have to, we're, we're being asked to think about scenarios and maybe do them, and they're, um, they're, they're being asked to. to do them, so, um, right, legislatively. So they, ha- they, have to, they have to take some things and move, and you might want to familiarize yourself with what they're, yes. um, what they're up to. I think it's, we think it's, I mean, it's not something we took on lightly on our work plan. It's, it's, it is a big issue, but I, I think um, we feel like there's an, if we all, if no one knows a whole lot about it, that's the time to learn. Um, and then it's an opportunity to get a, ahead of the curve in terms of controlling what our response is as a community. Um, so I wanted, just, just, I wanted to add a couple things with regard to what I heard. Um, first of all, um, with respect to social equity, it actually struck me that there's a piece that's in our work plan that's still there that isn't actually written down, which is we we have um, initiated working with the Human Rights Commission. Um, we've learned that you know the way in which they go about making decisions and the time frame that that drives their work is you know our commissions are different in terms of the culture of their meetings, the culture of their decision making. So. We have made the offer. We've met with them a couple of times. We've presented to them. They've presented to us. We're looking for that comfortable common ground to act together in the same way that we've been able to find with the Planning Commission. It just may take a while because you can't force um, you, you can't force voluntary <laughs> collaboration. Um, and we are committed to um, utilizing that relationship to help us better get at um, this, that side of the three, e, the, the three parts of sustainability. So it's not we've forgotten about it. Um, it's we are trying to pace our work with um, a group that we respect and want to work fully with um, on that endeavor. So I think we should probably put some mention of that back in our work plan if, if so desired. Um, it, it means, though, it's not a standalone like work with the Human Rights Commission, is that in the different pieces of work that we're doing, there are opportunities to go to the Human Rights Commission and say, could you work with us on this? Or is there something related to this that you're working on that we can help you with? Um, so I wouldn't see it standing alone, but maybe send just some mention that that's part of our process. Um, with respect to balancing the 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 different parts of sustainability. I think the example of how we're going, I'm on the Sustainable Business Practices Subcommittee, so an ex- as an example of how we're going about this, um, we are interviewing and we are start to look at how could the city better support sustainable business practices and what is it doing that's making it difficult for businesses to engage in sustainable business practices. It's, it's interview based with a diverse set of businesses we're starting with. And we're going to start with sort of, a, sort of a checklist of the kinds of things in the three 
three areas of sustainability that businesses might be undertaking. But we're, we're, we're not trying to judge them. We're really trying to engage in a conversation of, so why, why are you doing the things you were doing? What makes that easy? Um, what are the things you wish you could do that you can't? Um, what are the impediments? And, and out of that, we want to come up with some policy recommendations back to you that aren't based on, on um, you know, ideas from somewhere else that look glamorous about sustainability, but that are based in the experience of the business community around environmental, economic, and equity issues in our community. So I think all of our different committees are looking at various pieces of outreach and, and to new stakeholders, of getting really informed about what's happening in our community, and basing all our recommendations based on that. And then we'll bring in other ideas as ways in which other communities which have experienced similar issues um, have done. Um, the other thing I just, I, I also uh, wanted to respond to that I, for, well, I didn't, re I point out that I didn't point out in my initial commentary. It relates to the mayor's issue of um, don't try to do everything yourself. Um, is one of the, th one of the places we think we can add value, and again, it's woven in the work plan, is by helping to bring visibility to the good work of everyone who's working on sustainability, not just the commission. There are many, many good things happening in our community, and um, telling that story, telling that story in the course of the work that we're doing out in the community is part of helping people to see all of the efforts are making a difference. So that part of the communication is also in our work plan. It's just not called out as such. Um, because we know we're not going to do it all. And God forbid that that would be, I think we'd all resign <laughs> if that was the charge. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't speak for anybody else. I would be really nervous if that were the charge. Um, so again, I appreciate uh, both your, your encouraging us to pick our role. Um, and I think we, we really do hear the importance of balancing um, the retreat conversation was really interesting and in just thinking about what things we choose to do and what things we wouldn't, where we could add value, and who we would talk to to make sure that we actually were bringing value. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. One little more comment that, that when we developed the work plan and we put them all up on the work board, people had to step up and say, I want to do that mm -hmm. in order for it to get on here. Mm -hmm. So that, that it, it's right. not just a kind of a wish list, but we act, and then from that we created subcommittees to be able to follow up on each one of these. So um, that, I think, enhances the likelihood that you know, they'll actually get um, followed through. And there, of course, there's 13 people on the commission, so that's a good number of people. <coughs> in in terms of your sustainable time. business practices, um, I don't because time has passed by. I would you, and you're probably already doing this, but I just suggest they go back to the um, sustainable business initiative yes. document because yes. we had roundtables of all those businesses and, and and each of them had recommendations that came out that got funneled and came and that's yeah. why the commission's here and all of that kind of stuff. So just kind of going back to to that might um, let you start at a different place in that um, yeah, that discussion. is the plan absolutely. Okay, yeah. good, 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 good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, need to put a motion. Need a motion. Oh, yes. oh, yeah, George. George. I move to approve the Sustainability Commission FY13 work plan. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five. None in opposition. It passes. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. you being here. Thank you. Thanks for all your work on the budget and everything too.